So you have this sin in your life. You have this thing that you just keep on doing and, and you just can't stop doing it. And you just, you feel like, you know, that you just, you're bound to do this sin over and over and over again. Uh, for some reason, you just can't find victory over it. You know, maybe you've went through stages of, of trying to justify it. Maybe you've went through stages of maybe just resigning yourself to this sin. But you know that it's not God's will for you to sin. And you know that it, God is able to set you free from this sin. And yes, God is able. I'm going to give you three points here. Three steps to freedom from sin. Number one is that you must hate sin. First of all, I mean, there's a lot of people that say, you know, I, I know I sin, I shouldn't sin, but you know, deep down inside, they like it. They like it. They like to sin. Well, you need to understand that God hates sin, okay? Because of sin, God sent the flood in Noah's day. Because of sin, he devoured the, the, uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding areas with fire. Because of sin, he pronounced many curses upon people in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to 68. Because of sin, God sent an angel to strike Herod and strike him dead, to be eaten by worms on the spot. Because of sin, what might seem to be a little white sin, Ananias and Sapphira got struck down dead in Acts chapter 5. God hates sin, okay? And what you need to do is you need to, you need to develop the same kind of hatred towards sin. You need to pray, God, Give me a hatred towards sin. Help me to, to, to hate sin like you do. Help me to, to, uh, to see sin as you see it, as this very dark and destructive force, this thing that goes against the, the creation of God. Okay? So the first thing you got to do is you got to hate sin. You've got to identify sin. You've got to wage war. You've got to declare war on sin. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, it, it's very clear. God said to Cain, If you, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. See, God talks about sin as if sin is a personality, okay? Sin is crouching by the door. Sin is waiting by the door. And sin is kind of like, is, is like uh, staging an ambush against you. You have got to wage war against sin. You have got to realize that sin has got strategies against you and that it's not good, okay? It's not good. And you have to overcome that sin. You have to fight that battle. You have to win that war. So yes, step number one, you have got to resist. You have got to hate sin. Step number two is you have to remove the evil influence in your life, okay? Now the scripture says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and then I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. You have to come out from that evil influence. Perhaps the evil influence are, you know, is, perhaps evil influence comes, it comes to you in the form of magazines, perhaps television, perhaps internet, perhaps the friends you hang around, perhaps even family members. You have to come out from among them. You have to be separate. You have to wage war against that sin by, first of all, not being friends with that sin, okay? You have to come out from among the people who tend to do things that maybe might stage some kind of temptation in your life. Do you want to quit smoking? You know, it's difficult to quit smoking when you got someone in your life when you always hang around people that smoke. You want to quit drinking. It's difficult to quit drinking when you always hang around people who drink. You, got, you, know, you want to quit using filthy language. Well, you know, it might not be very easy to quit doing it if all you hear all day is filthy language. You have got to remove yourself from that influence. You have to come out from among them and be separate. That could be a whole lot more than just social changes, okay? That can, be, that can mean a whole lot more than just changing, you know, uh, who you hang around with, you know, after work. It could mean actually changing your entire job, okay? 
perhaps you work, let's say for an example, you work in the pornography industry. You know what? You need to change your profession. You need to find a new job. You need to get out of that situation. Perhaps you work, you know, perhaps you're an alcoholic or perhaps you struggle with alcohol and you work as a bartender. You know what? You need to get out of that position. And I know that this is, uh, you know, a lot easier said than done, but yes, in your fight against sin, you have to fight hard. That could mean quitting your job. You know, the book of Hebrews really challenges us to fight against sin. It says you've not yet resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood, okay? So, I mean, hey, that is quite the, quite the challenge there. And so we are called to resist sin. We are called to come out from among them. Perhaps, perhaps that means, you know, stop going to websites that you're going to. Perhaps that means stop watching videos that you're watching. Perhaps that means you need to put restrictions around yourself, your own daily activities. Perhaps you need to, you know, put uh, internet uh, limitations on yourself. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, you need to get rid of the influence in your life that is influencing you to sin. Anything that is a vehicle that brings temptation into your life needs to be removed to the best of your ability. And finally, the last and final step, the fatal blow, as it were, to sin, you need to know the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, okay? So the truth, the truth makes you free. You can be free from sin by knowing the truth. And you know, this is what Satan used in the first, you know, in, in Genesis chapter 3. He used deception to get sin into the world. Now, if you want to get sin out of your life, you need to get rid of the deception. And I know a lot of you would say, like, what? What deception are you talking about? Well, whenever there's sin, there is deception. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What truth, you might say? Well, the truth that sets you free is the truth about what happened on the cross. What happened, what Jesus did, okay? The whole idea of sin sacrifice, that is what the truth is, okay? A lot of you have, just like in Genesis chapter 3, Satan came to Eve with a lot of truth, but he had this little bit of a lie in there. It's a little bit of a deception in there, and it makes it so appealing because it looks true, but it's not. And so in the same way, a lot of you have heard the gospel, but if that gospel does not have truth in it that sets you free, then perhaps that gospel is not either the full gospel or it has been tainted a little bit with just a little bit of deception. I'm not saying that the preachers that you have heard and the preachers that you listen to uh, intentionally deceive you. Most likely they don't. But if you are bound to sin and you keep on hearing preaching about Jesus and Jesus on the cross, I would tell you, as a matter of fact, you are not hearing the truth. Remember, what is Jesus? John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the world by saying he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, okay? He didn't say, behold the Lamb of God who covers the sin of the world. He doesn't say, behold the, the Lamb of God who, who winks at the sin of the world and just pretends like it's not there. He didn't say, behold the Lamb of God that just excuses the sin of the world because after all, we're just human. No, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that's why you're listening to this video. You want to have the sin that you've been struggling with to be taken away from your life. You want to be free. And this is where it's at. This is where it's at. You need to know what the Lamb of God really is and what it entails. You need to know what the sin sacrifice is. Now, most Christians say, and they say, and they believe that Jesus is our sin sacrifice, the Lamb that was slain for us, and rightly so but they don't know exactly what that means. Or they don't know exactly all that entails, okay? They say Jesus is a sin sacrifice, 
but they don't know much about the sin sacrifice as it is described in the Torah. They don't know much about the sin sacrifice and how it works. All they, all they have is just the idea of, well, you know, back in the Old Testament, people would just bring an animal to be sacrificed, bring a lamb, you know, a spotless lamb, and, and, and that priest would just sacrifice the lamb. And, the, and, and in sacrificing the lamb, God would just say, okay, that lamb, uh, because of the blood that was spilt by that lamb, your sins are covered, your sins are atoned for. And so, you know, God's happy with that. So you walk away without having sin counted against you because you brought that sacrifice. Well, it worked that way, yes, but you need to know exactly how it works. And this is, this is where the problem lies. You see, a lot of people believe that back in Old Testament times when somebody you know, had sin in their life, they would just bring a lamb sacrifice and, and that sacrifice would cause God just to you know, forgive their sin kind of just almost like magically. And that, you know, so God would be just happy with them until Jesus came. So somehow that sin sacrifice just you know, cause God to just forget their sin or just not count it against them. Just kind of like some kind of a magical thing that they did that caused God just to say, okay, you sacrificed your lamb, therefore I'm not going to count that sin against you. I forgive you of your sin. Go, I'm happy now. And that's just how it went day in and day out until Jesus came. Well, what you need to realize is it was a whole lot more than that. So if sacrifices cause God to forgive sin, if it was animal sacrifices, another word for sacrifices would be offerings. So if it was sacrifices or offerings that cause God to you know, forgive sin and just excuse sin, then why did God say so much against their offerings? Let's look at a few passages. That, and I want you to think about this. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken the fat, than the fat of rams. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now, if sacrifice caused God to forgive your wickedness, then why would sacrifice be an abomination? Why would the sacrifice of the wicked be an abomination to the Lord? Let's read on. Again, in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he brings it with a wicked mind? Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 15, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense as an abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbaths, the, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 27. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I will not smell in your, in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as the mighty stream. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of Molech, and Chiun, your images, the star, the star of your God, 
which you made to yourselves. Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Finally, Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin have you not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. So after reading those passages, you must ask the question, how is it that God commanded the children of Israel? In fact, not only the children of Israel, but we got Abel, we've got Abraham, we've got Isaac, we've got a lot of the patriarchs. They all offered sacrifices as in animals, animals sacrifice to the Lord. How is it that God commanded that? And then later on, he's like, I don't want this. It's not what I require of you. That's not what I want. I hate your sacrifices. How is that? Now, what you need to understand is that the Bible is a book that is a compilation of many books, each of which was written by Jews. All of the scriptures came to us by Jewish people. So you need to look at this from a Jewish perspective. You know, when John the Baptist said about Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, nobody asked him, What do you mean by the Lamb of God? Everybody knew. Today, you know, apart from, you know, Orthodox Jews or apart from the people in Israel, uh, apart from those who are well versed in sacrifices, you know, if you say, Behold the Lamb of God, people will be like, What do you mean? Well, they all knew what he meant. But the problem is today, we don't know. What, the, what that means, the Lamb of God, sin sacrifice. We don't know how that works. We've lost it. Ask any Jewish rabbi today, how did sin sacrifice work, okay? How did, how did that work? How does it work that, that God asked people to bring animals to be sacrificed? Why and how? This is what happened, okay? Let's say, for example, you are bound in some sin. You have some sin in your life you need to have that dealt with. So you go and you get your animal. You get your sacrifice. Be it an ox, be it a bull, be it a lamb. Okay? So you take that lamb to the temple. You take it to the priest. And you give it to the priest. And the priest would, the priest would look it over. And if it's acceptable, the priest would accept it and begin the sacrifice process right there. You're standing there and you're watching it. The priest would slaughter that lamb. And as you watch that lamb die, you, you are supposed to say to yourself, I am dying with that lamb. That lamb signifies, that lamb is a symbol is symbolic of my sin, is symbolic of my sinful lifestyle, is symbolic of my selfishness. When that lamb dies, my sin dies. I die with that lamb, okay? And when they took the, the fat of that lamb and put it on the altar to burn on the altar, so the idea is, as you watch that priest burn the fat of that lamb on the altar, you're supposed to watch it being burned. You're supposed to watch it being consumed. And you're supposed to say, as that fat is being consumed, so the lust and the passions and the desire for sin is being consumed as well. My lust is being burned away with that fat. My desire is being burned away with that fat. So therefore, when you walk away after that lamb is, is sacrificed, you are supposed to be completely free of that sin. That is how the sin is covered. When you walk away, you're, you're supposed to walk away saying, wow. My sin just died with that lamb. Well, you know, when the fat was burned, there goes my lust. There goes the passion for that sin. You know, and you know, Paul the Apostle, being a Jew, being a Jewish rabbi, being taught under Gamaliel, he knew this, this whole entire principle. He knew how it worked. That's why he said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. This is the whole thing, you see. A lot of people preach today that when Jesus died, he died in your place. He died like instead of you. So that he died so that you don't have to die. That's not what the scripture says. And that is what's tainting the gospel today. And that is what's keeping you in sin. It's like, well, Jesus died in my place. Jesus died so that I don't have to die. Jesus was on the cross so that I don't have to go to the cross. Not so, my friend. It's what it says. What the scripture says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, we are supposed to identify with Jesus on the cross. Not say, well, he's up there, I'm down here. I can go free, free to sin, 
because Jesus already died for me. That's not how it works. When Jesus died, you're supposed to look upon him and you're supposed to say, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with him. Not he died in my place. When he died, I died. When he rose from the, from the grave, I rose. That's newness of life. That's being born anew, born again. Okay? So it's identifying with Jesus. Okay? That's where it's all at. If you get that in your spirit, if you can take that by faith, you will find freedom from the sin that is binding you. You will find freedom from that slavery that you are in right now. You are enslaved to sin. If you sin, you are a slave to sin, as the scripture says. What you got to do is you got to look by faith to the cross and you got to say, I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead. Dead men don't sin. Okay, this is what Paul meant when he said in, in Romans chapter 6, he said, how can you who are dead to sin live in it any longer? You cannot sin because you're dead to sin. If you truly do identify with Jesus on the cross, you make yourself one with him, spiritually speaking. You, you connect with Jesus on that cross, okay? And so when he died, you say, my sin died. It says in, in 2 Corinthians that he became sin for us. When he died, we died. Okay? When he died, we died. And that is the truth that will set you free. Every time Satan comes back, every time the devil comes back to tempt you to sin, what you got to do is you got to say, get behind me, Satan, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Get behind me, Satan. I am dead to sin and alive to God. There's no way I can sin anymore because I am dead to sin. I can't live in it any longer. That is the truth that will set you free. You need to take it by faith. You need to look at it by faith. You need to proclaim it. You need to proclaim it to the forces that be. You are crucified with Christ. You are dead to sin. When Jesus died, he didn't just die for you in that sense. He, you died with him. That's the whole idea of sin sacrifice. That is why when these people, the people of Israel, when they kept on doing sin sacrifices, yet they kept sinning. God's like, listen, you guys don't get it at all. I don't want your, your sacrifices. I don't want your lambs, the fat of rams and lambs. I don't, it's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I don't like it at all. I don't want that. That's not, what I, that's not what I want. That's not what I want at all. I want you to stop sinning. Don't you understand? The purpose of the sin sacrifice is to provide a catalyst for you to repent. That's the way it was in, in the so-called Old Testament with the lamb sacrifice. And that's the way it is right now with the lamb sacrifice of the Son of God. It, it's not so that we can just say, oh, Jesus died for me and we keep on sinning. No, that's not how it works. And God will say the same thing. I don't want your faith if that's the kind of faith that you have, that you have faith that Jesus died for you, but you can, you can keep on sinning. I don't want it. Just like how he said to the people in, in the Old Testament, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your sacrifices. Why? Because you haven't been able to connect to it. You didn't connect to that sacrifice enough to let that sacrifice provide you with enough power to repent. You didn't connect with that sacrifice in such a way that it would be a catalyst for you to repent. Okay? That's where it's all at. That's why Jesus said the first thing he preached was repentance. You know, throughout his ministry, he preached repentance. The last thing he said to his church, in, 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 uh, to his church by the way, in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 was repent. It's, that's where it's all at. Jesus died so that you could look upon him and say, I am crucified with Christ. I am dead to sin, Romans chapter 6. Therefore, I can't live in sin any longer. Jesus died so that you could be free from sin. And if your doctrine does not allow for you to be completely free from sin, then God doesn't want it and neither does the world. So that's the truth that will set you free. So as you go, take that truth and run with it because it is the truth and it will make you free.